Welcome to an exciting episode of the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down with the councillor for the city of Kenora, Ontario, Lindsay Koch. But before we get into today's episode, I want to take a moment and ask you to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening or viewing this episode. That way you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews with amazing municipal leaders from across this great country. Now, on to the show. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to start with the question that I have started all my interviews off, so you're no exception to the rule. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Counselor? Gosh, you know, it started in high school on student council and fine arts council and choir and all of the things that uh, got me interested in how I met people and made friends. And um, it just sort of carried through into my adult life. When I moved back to Kenora, I went to the University of Winnipeg. When I moved back, I reached out to volunteer organizations to see how I could get reinvolved. Um, when you come from a small town, lots of your friends go, I'm never coming back. I want to move away and I never want to come back. And so they did that. And I didn't really know uh, many people coming back. So my first step was to get involved. And I haven't really looked back since then. I've, I I don't think there's a day since when I 2009 when I came back to Kenora where I haven't been involved on a board, a, excuse me, a committee uh, in some kind of fundraising initiative. Um just to to give back, be involved, make connections. It's always just felt important to me. So giving back, you can give back in many different ways, though, but you chose the municipal route. Before we get <laughs> into why you chose that, I, I want to learn a little bit more about who Lindsay is. And I, I want to start with this question. Was politics something that was an interest of yours growing up, or was it something that you grew into in later life? I definitely grew into it. No interest at all. Not the keenest civics class student. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a real millennial here and say that I really followed the Barack Obama campaign and the way that he engaged people and got young people involved in considering how they play a role in the demo democratic system, excuse me, just really got me thinking. And I know it's different than Canada, but um, for the first time, it really engaged me and in my understanding of how everybody plays a role in the democratic process. And um, at that point, I still didn't necessarily think I would land right in the middle of it uh, at any level. Um, but uh, it definitely got my brain moving and I started paying more attention. And I thought if I can focus on what's going on in the States, I probably should focus on what's going on in Canada uh, and even closer to home in uh, in Canada. When from that 2008 campaign, which Barack Obama wins the presidency of the United States, do you start getting involved locally, municipally, for federally, provincially in local elections? Or do you just randomly wake up one day and say, well, I'm going to put my name for it because I think it's the best way that I can do uh, serve my community? Uh, no. So I um. <laughs> I got involved in some city committees first. I was the co-chair of the City of Kenora Tourism Committee uh, and also the Lake of the Woods Development Commission, which was uh, an economic development committee of the city. Um, and I sat on the board for our Lake of the Woods Museum, which is the best small museum in Canada, I believe is their moniker. Uh, a little plug there. Um, and uh, I made connections with our local counselors. Again, small town, you have that opportunity to really build those relationships. Um, paid attention to the work they were doing, noticed how the committee work that I was doing as part of city committees was informing the decisions that were being made at council table. Uh, noticed when I was disappointed if things didn't maybe align with the recommendations that were coming from the committee, where the funding was going, different things like that. Um, and so, it's somewhere in my mind, I knew that I would do it one day. I didn't necessarily think coming out of a pandemic, having a toddler, like I work in public health. So I was like, you are already stretched thin. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think this would be the time, but um, there was, as with any election, I think just an air of change in the air and, and it felt right somehow. 
So correct me if I'm wrong, and I think I am here, but Kenora is, uh, their counselors are elected as a ward counselor, right? Or are they elected at an at-large? At-large. Okay. So you you decide in 2022 to put your name forward for municipal politics. So this is your first election. Your name is on the ballot. I like asking this question because I remember my first election where I saw my name on the ballot and it was the most surreal experience of my life for (laughs) you walking into that ballot box and seeing your name and putting an X beside your name. What was that moment like for you? Well, (laughs) we did electronic voting, so a little bit less. (laughs) A little bit less. Okay, but days. but you still got to press a button or do a yeah. check mark on an email. So what was that moment like for you, seeing your name beside every other person that you've come to know during the uh, an election? Um, it just made sense. I just felt good about it. I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that answer. So it makes sense. You get elected. Now the real work begins. You are coming up to a year of being in office. As of October, it'll be a year since the last municipal election in the province of Ontario. What's been the biggest learning curve for you? Because being an outsider looking on, the, looking in is always different from being an insider looking out. So for you, what's been the last year learning curve for you being like? I think, and I'm going to speak for most of council here because we are very new. Our mayor was a was a counselor and we have one other counselor who served about 18 months. He came in midterm. Um, so we are very new, lots of learning. I would say the biggest one for me, um, because I'm a person who works in policy and understands how policy is created and set and council's role in that. So for me, it was really navigating the council administration relationship and who does what and what should, you know, who replies to the public on certain issues, things like that. Um, continues to be something that I'm trying to navigate. And I think we're navigating together um, because, you know, one council will do it one way. And and so the di- different ways we engage with the public and how we decide who's doing that, what we can assign to um, city administration to take on and how we, how we make good informed decisions so that we are setting them up for success. I want to jump in on a phrase you just said, like literally in the last end of that sentence there before I was going to ask my next question, but good informed decisions. That's a big takeaway for a lot of the roles and responsibilities that a counselor has to make because the decisions you make impact your residents the most. Um, And they impact the residents the day after you make those decisions. So how do you as a counselor, as the first term counselor, make good informed decisions that are in the best for everyone and make sure that what you're doing is going to have not the least impact, but have the most uh, less financial impact on people because there is a big issue going on in this country about cost of living. So how do you make good informed decisions around what's going on outside of the municipality as well? For me, it's about being proactive, um, kind of reading the landscape a little bit and and learning about the various inputs. Um, and so certainly communication with uh, all of the residents, not even just those who are our municipal taxpayers, um, but the people who access our area, how they're impacted, because Kenora, if you don't know, because we're north, we're a bit of a hub for lots of unorganized territories, First Nations communities. Um, so lots of the people who are using our community are not actually municipal taxpayers. Um, so lots of engagement all around. Uh, it, admittedly, I don't get as much of that as I would like. I reach out and I I put myself out to receive feedback, but um, some of my other counselors and certainly the mayor receive a lot more phone calls than I do. And so uh, if you're listening, I want to hear from you. Um I want to I want to pick I want to pick up on that for a second because you just hit on a key point that I love. There is an apathy in this country when it comes to politics. There's an apathy, particularly when it comes to municipal politics. Unless your water doesn't turn on, unless your water hot water doesn't turn on, or your garbage isn't picked up, the majority of residents and I hate to paint a broad stroke here, but I think I have to. uh, The majority of people don't 
really want to deal with their municipal. They want to deal with provincial and federal, but you're an important part of the sort of the jigsaw puzzle that is democracy in Canada. So when you do get people who actually do talk to you, are they talking to you more about provincial and federal jurisdictional issues compared to municipal? Or are you finding people are actually engaged and understand the different levels of jurisdictions that sort of municipal councils have to deal with compared to federal and provincial? I think it's um, a bit of an ongoing mystery uh, because <laughs> <laughs> the, the province, so municipalities, as you know, are a product of the province. Um, we receive a lot from them in terms of funding and permissions and they set our legislation, things like that. We also, I'm gonna use the word download, whether people like it or not, they download a lot onto municipalities. And so um, people feel like the municipality is maybe responsible for things that it, it just can't possibly dig into without support from the province or, or partnership with the province on some level. And so that's really challenging, especially as we're navigating mental health and addictions, things like that, homelessness, housing funding, our municipality, for example, we don't have municipal housing. It's, it's our district social services board who operates that uh, and private development. So um, the things that really people are calling about which in, in, in our area, it really is uh, harm reduction, mental health and addictions, treatment, lack of treatment, actually. Um, those are things that are really hard for us to navigate. And I don't always want to say this is a provincial issue because we certainly have a role here. We're advocating all the time. We've done delegations recently at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference um, with the Ministry of Health. And so there are things that municipal governments can do to engage the province uh, so we're, you're right, we're a key piece of that jigsaw puzzle because we have those relationships, we have the access to the decision makers at the province, but we're also talking about potholes and road plowing and snow removal and all of those things that really impact people first thing in the morning when they wake up. And so uh, that's one of those pieces of, of council versus administration. What can we help administration do so that the, the community members can have those right now sort of things corrected is it hard to balance that jigsaw puzzle though <clears throat> because when people come to any level of government whether it be your mpp your mp or your councillor or mayor or whatever they want you to fix the issue they don't want to be past the buck they don't want like you just said they don't want you to just push it off to say it's a provincial jurisdiction or it's a federal jurisdiction they want you to help solve it in your role in the last year, I know it's you're still relatively fresh and you're relatively a green new counselor. Uh, and I mean that with respect, it's just because I've talked to people who have been in the job for 20 years. I've talked to people who've been in the job for like two weeks because they just got elected by a uh, by-election. So you're relatively still on the newer side. Is it hard to sort of balance what you can do with the reality of what you should or what you should do with the reality of what you can do? Yeah, because we want to do those things. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't think anyone runs for, for I'll say municipal council. I don't know why people run for political or federal government because that freaks me out. But, um, well, that's what you say now. Give it ten years, you'll <laughs> want to join the provincial. But, right. Maybe, um, you know, I, I want those changes now too. And politics, unfortunately, is the long game. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of making sure there's evidence to back up, you know, especially when you're trying to make things that are connected to health decisions. That's hugely evidence-based. And we can't just make decisions willy-nilly that are going to maybe do something. However, there are, you know, quick things that can be done. Uh, you know, at the AMO conference recently, with, with the mayor of London who said, fail fast, correct quickly, and keep trying until you arrive at a solution that's going to work in your local context. And I believe that fully. And so it's difficult, um, but not impossible to act a little bit more quickly on some of the bigger issues. You have been thrust into the proverbial uh, limelight of municipal uh, politics because you don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You don't go off to Queens Park to do your job. You are in your community 24-7. You make a decision, you go to the grocery store that night or the next day, and people might stop you. You say you want more people to do that or more people to reach out and talk to you about their issues, but I'm assuming you've had people stop you and want to talk to you. 
have you found the balance of being just Lindsay and being counselor Koch difficult over the last <laughs> year? And I, you, you joke, and I, a lot of people do laugh when I ask that question. It's just, I understand that you are counselor Koch 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year, no matter how hard you try, but there must be some try, t- some sense of balance that you need to strike for yourself. So that way the job doesn't overtake who you are. Yeah. Um, I, I feel okay about it, but I have also been wearing many hats for a long time. And so I think there's some comfort there for me. I also find, and I'm grateful for this, that if I'm out with my, with my son or my family, people don't tend to approach, uh, in the same way, which is nice. I I really appreciate that. I'll say show of respect. Um, and also I, I don't really mind it. (laughs) Like I, if that's the way you're going to find me and talk to me, that's great. Please do it before we're making the decision that you're concerned about. That's, that's one of, you know, one of the challenges I've found is sometimes people will watch the live stream of, of the council meeting and then send an email after we made that decision, but we didn't hear from them before we made the decision. And so that's kind of unfortunate. And and I've passed that feedback on to those people and hopes that they will, you know, as we approach budget time this year, maybe speak up in advance because my reality and the reality of every counselor is that we don't know your experience. For example, I don't pay city water fees because I'm on the well and septic, but that doesn't mean I don't want to know about it so that I can make good decisions for the people who aren't in my situation. And and we rely on that feedback from people in order to do that. You you rely on the feedback to make those decisions, but I'm assuming there has to come a respect into that position as well, because I'm assuming you will hear a range of uh, different viewpoints. And sometimes people may, and I hate to use this word, but I think I have to attack. They may seem like you're not doing it for the best of everyone. You're just trying to profiteer from yourself. And we have seen the rise of online hate. We have seen the rise of online verbal abuse uh, aimed towards municipal counselors over the last year, probably since the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you engage with people in a respectful way that they feel like they've been heard? But also at the same time, you are respecting them enough to know that you're there to represent them, even if they didn't vote for you. I so when I campaigned, I, I kind of touched on that a little bit. I I want to do the best for my community in the in the way that I can, like I said before, making good informed decisions. Uh, I made no promises about any particular thing, just that I would make informed decisions. Um, and so, I mean, you, you look at the numbers, I didn't get the most votes. I didn't get the least votes. So some people definitely didn't vote for me, <laughs> but, um, I don't, I don't care how you vote. I, you know, just like, I don't care what your, your party politics are. I care that you want to live where you live. And so if I can make a decision about water meters, which is a, a hot button topic where we are in, in multi-residential buildings, then I'm going to do what makes the most sense. Of course, I'm going to look out for the the municipal budget, but I'm I'm also not wanting everybody to come out of pocket all the time just so they can have a quality of life that they have a right to. I want to turn to my next subject because I'm, I'm cautious of time and we're about 20 minutes into the interview already. And I want to talk about Kenora as a whole. And I want to preface this conversation, this part of the conversation by saying this. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is Councillor Koch's opinion, talking to the host of the Cross Border Interviews. Thank you. And I, I want. <laughs> I seem to get a lot of emails. I'm not sure why they're directed at me by this question, but I do get them. I want to. I want to ask the big question, and this is your opinion, and only your opinion. What is the biggest issue as of recording this interview facing? Kenora today or issues sure um mental health and addictions treatment and the way we are funded uh for this work um so again this is a bit of a provincial animal um but because like i said we're a hub uh and our geography is kind of wonky um 
there is no or really limited addictions treatment uh, that is accessible to people who are struggling in that area, whether they're homeless or not. Um, and there are many organizations who have some funding for, for this type of work, but nobody wants to lose their funding by collaborating uh, with their resources to make an impact in the way that I think we can. And so that's something we're talking to the province about. Um, but we're- So we're while, while you're talking to the province, and I hate to interrupt because I, I need to get this on the record. While you're talking to the province, this issue is not going away. And I, I, I usually uh, ask this later on, but I'm going to add this into this part of this uh, show right now. I was recently up in Kenora. I traveled through the community. I stopped in, I stayed there for a day and I drove right through. And usually when I'm in a community like this, I try to get a sense of what the community's wants and needs are. And I, I go to Tim Hortons or go to the local coffee shop, which at this time it was McDonald's. And I stopped in and I asked a few people at the counter waiting for their order, what are the big issues facing your community? And probably about five out of the eight of them said that exact same issue, mental health and addictions. There's an issue going on in the city we're trying to solve it. Provincial, federal, municipal don't seem to be dealing with it as quickly as they should be because it's becoming more rampant. And, I, and I'm getting to the question here now. You say it's a provincial issue. We, You and I have just openly said that sometimes the province takes a little bit longer to get to what they're doing. So the municipalities are left holding the bag. And you have to sort of try to step in to fill that gap until the province or the federal government come in. What is the city doing now to address the issue of mental health and addiction while you wait for those ongoing conversations that are going on with the provincial government? That's a great question. Um, so, in, Very long uh, question. I apologize. But I needed to get that first caveat out to understand where my question was coming from. Yeah. Um, so in December last year, we had some uh, events take place where, where shop owners were there was some violent uh, offenses that happened and it was a scary time. And so we had a sort of a big community meeting in council chambers. And the outcome of that was that we were going to hire a community safety and well-being coordinator um, to lead the work of the legislated crime prevention and community safety and well-being committee uh, that Ontario requires us to have uh, for a plan for. And so we have a committee, it's lots of community stakeholders in, in the groups that make sense. Um, and uh, they're actually just meeting for the first time this September. It took a little bit to onboard this person, but he's in the role, he's building his relationships and we're doing that. So remains to be seen kind of where that work leads, but he'll play a key role in that he'll sit uh, as part of our Ontario health team, which has a mental health and addictions working group. Um, again, with some of the key players. The other thing we're doing is really focusing on how we can work with the DSAB uh, the District Social Services Administration Board to um, get some housing off the ground. And so I think what we're going to see in the next year or 18 months as these things uh, open up, because we're well well into some builds, um, including some supportive housing with uh, on-site services uh, for, for those who are living unhoused and are experiencing mental health and addictions challenges. Um, I think we're going to, gosh, I hope we're going to see a, a bit of a turn like not not a full like 90 degrees, but it's going to start to shift uh, as housing becomes available because housing first is such an important principle um, that I, I really wish more people understood. Um, and uh, maybe that's some of the work that we can do is help to educate the public on how housing helps people navigate all of the social determinants of health that are impacting their lives. You talk about the downloading aspect of municipal governments right now from provincial and even federal governments downloading onto the municipalities. But at the end of the day, you and I both know that municipalities don't have an unlimited supply of money as much as they want to, they don't. And you have to have you have to sort of evaluate the needs and wants of your community, but also adds it add in the what can we, what do we want? What do we need, but has to be put off because we just can't afford it right now. On top of that, you have residents, I'm assuming, coming to the cities asking for issues to be resolved, whether it be 
funding for new potholes, whether it be a, a indoor swimming pool, this, that, or the other. And I say indoor swimming pool because that's what most people talk about when I ask this question. How do you balance the needs and wants of your community and ensure that everyone feels like they're getting ahead, but also ensure that all the issues that people are bringing to the city, whether it be you or your fellow councillors or even the mayor, are being addressed and not being forgotten because you don't want anyone to ever feel like you're not being listened to. And going back to sort of the Barack Obama, engaging with people so that way they feel like they're part of the democratic process. Uh, so something that I, I don't know if it's new, but I think it is new for the city's budgeting process is we've created something uh, for, for review during our whole months long process that we're calling the unfunded list. And so it's kind of it's kind of the wish list. Like right now, we don't know how it's going to be funded. Um, so we're going to go through the things that we kind of feel like we got to do, the infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff that keeps people getting from A to B and, and safe in the city, uh, other than community safety <laughs> things. Um, it, it, so it's kind of a wish list. Like on it right now, there's an art center, there's a dog park, there's things that are great ideas. And, you know, we have a really great team. Our, our development team is amazing at finding funding and looking at how we can leverage municipal dollars for um, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, for example, does a lot of, of grants um, or dollar matching. And so that's kind of where that stuff lives. We're also fortunate that we have the municipal accommodation tax. So that focuses on tourism and economic development. That's all allocated for that. And so the fun things kind of come out of there. Uh, and so I think we have sort of a couple tools to use so that we're not only focused on the the unsexy things, we can kind of, can I say that? Um, no, oh, we, we've, we've had <laughs> municipal politicians crack a beer on the show, so you can do whatever you want, <laughs> Lindsay. Yeah, so uh, I, I firmly believe that um, it's not only the roads that are important. It's not only um, like the it, bricks while and it's... mortar kind of things. It's the stuff that makes you happy to show people around. Uh, and so I'm I'm very happy to try and find ways to to make that that pretty stuff happen because you don't go to places like Banff or Canmore just for the mountain like I love a mountain but you go there because they've done some nice things it's walkable there's shops there's engaging things and photo ops and it's just charming to walk through and I want that for the people who live here year-round and I want that for people who want to come visit us like yourself I hope you'll come back oh I I certainly am because I I was only there from like about I think it was about six five or six o'clock in the afternoon till about 12 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. So from Saturday to Sunday, but I can tell you it was a beautiful location. We're going to talk about tourism in a few seconds, but you just said something that just clicked into me. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure this is, I'm, I'm up, up Creek without a paddle on this one, but did I read somewhere that you are originally from Alberta and then you moved to Kenora when you were young or you moved from Kenora to Alberta and then back? Yeah, I was born in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Oh, <laughs> okay. So I, I should have asked this at the beginning. How does the Fort Saskatchewan girl get herself to Kenora? Is it family or is it just you? You decided that Kenora was where I was wanted to be? Uh, we moved to uh, a small, small town outside of Kenora called Manaki when I was like eight. Um, my dad got a job in Kenora. He had a connection there who grew up in Rainy River, which is in the area. Um, and so okay, so it was family here, and I never really left. I guess. Hey, well, Fort Saskatchewan is always a great community. Hopefully, the mayor will come on. Um, <laughs> I, w- I want to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, because I believe that tourism is an important aspect of this country, and I think that most Canadians don't do it as often as I think they should. We often talk about going on to Disney World or going to L.A. or uh, Florida or Mexico or Cancun or Europe, but there's so many undiscovered hidden gems in this country that people do not see on a regular basis. As I just said, I had the pleasure of visiting your community. Now, I did not take in as much as I should have, and I feel like I just not even scratched the surface on when it comes to the city of Kenora. 
But I want to know from you, because I have already planned my next trip in the spring of 2024 to come back to Kenora, but also come back through Northern Ontario. What are the hidden gems that tourists should see when they're in the city? Oh, I love this. Okay. I love it. I'm like a big <laughs> hiker. And so I love our trail systems. We have some urban trails, which are, which are accessible. We have lots of nature trails uh, within the city and on the outskirts of the city that I think are, they just show off the lakes. They show off the vegetation that's native to the area. You can pick blueberries and raspberries on your way. There's waterfalls. Uh, there's swimming holes all over the place. That's my favorite thing to do. Um, in the city, there's the, there's the big shiny things. Like you drive in and you see this giant boat. It's called the MS Kenora. It does a beautiful cruise uh, a few times a day. Um, it's a great way if you are not comfortable driving a boat, which you can rent from a couple of the marinas to get out and see Lake of the Woods, which is the shiny, sparkly gem uh, that people come for a lot of the times. But there's so many other lakes around so many so much fishing uh if you like that i feel like i'm talking exclusively nature so you can probably tell that's my that's my passion um do you know what i love to just grab a coffee from a local shop and walk and i like i love walking in the downtown um the chip truck next time you come get french fries from the chip truck it's like the biggest it's like people come for the french fries like a landmark um i i i i had the pleasure of walking downtown so I, I got the hotel and i decided well i've got nothing else to do because i don't know much many people in kenora so i'm going to take a little a walk downtown and i i am sorry but i need to blow smoke here for a second but i think it's the honest to goodness smoke I have seen a lot of downtown communities i have been to many communities across this great country um Unless you get off the beaten path, you would never know that Kenora has probably one of the most vibrant, and I say that even being a Saturday night to Sunday morning uh, tour, vibrant downtowns that I've ever come across because it seems like you're stepping back into sort of a like a Hallmark movie with the rich the sort of the designs of all the buildings, but also the sort of the atmosphere that I felt when I was down there. People said hi to me that I didn't know. We were just saying, oh, hi. I'm like, Hi, how are you? Like, I'm from, I, I, I'm not used to this sort of welcome <laughs> hospitality. So give credence to your residents because you guys probably should be renamed the friendliest city in Canada because it was so friendly when I was there. Oh, I'm just beaming. That, that <laughs> makes me so happy to hear. Um, and, and, okay. So this, uh, I said this to uh, another counselor as well, but it's true. When I was in your local restaurant, Oh, at McDonald's, I usually ask the stupid question because I'm one of those people who will ask stupid questions. Um, do you know who your counselor or mayor are? That's how I got to know who your name, because only one person was able to name someone and they only named you. So I was like, well, guess I'm reaching out to her once I get back <laughs> to Ontario or Calgary to reach out to Lindsay because people seem to know who she is. So <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> so beam all you want you you've made a reputation with the one man from mcdonald's that was there on saturday night so there you that's go amazing i go to big cities we're just in london for amo and i smile at people when i walk down the street because that's just what i do and they look at me like are you about to ask me for something like what do you want and that's what i was thinking i was like well, what do you want like is this is this something <laughs> is something going wrong here like do i have something is my fly down so very friendly city for those who are listening. And I feel like we're getting off on a tangent, but I needed to make sure I put that plug in there. Thank um, you. I want to talk though about your relaxation spot. Where do you go in the city? You talk about how you love the nature, how you love the uh, sort of the outdoors. Where though could we find you decompressing after a long day of work? after a long day of a council meeting, after a long day of just being a counselor, where do you go to just let it all go away, refocus yourself, so that way the next day you can get back at it? Into a book somewhere, on a dock, on a deck, uh, like a rock on a trail. Uh, yeah, I just, and actually to uh there's a coffee shop there's two coffee shops that i like here are in play and and hojo and i like to just sometimes i'll bring my computer there and 
somehow it feels like, A, I can focus on the one thing I brought there to work on, but um, just feels like I can exist and, and be part of a community. I don't know. There's something really life-giving about just being amongst the people who live around you, being in community well, with one another that way. It seems like Kenora has got a sense of community and it's, it's not often that I can say that, but when you're there, you feel like everyone is working together for the betterment of the community. Yes, every community has some issues, but it seems like you're all pulling together to make sure that the city moves forward together, right? Yeah, we're trying hard. Think. Okay. Um, I want to end with my last question, and it kind of encompasses my yours last statement and my last statement, but I want to ask it anyway. What makes the city of Kenora such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family, counselor? I mean, you nailed it with the sense of community. I I feel safe here. I feel comfortable here. I feel happy that my kid gets to experience a wide variety of things. It's because we're kind of along the Trans Canada, we get lots of musical groups through, we get lots of um, different festivals and events and, and people here are really keen to make something happen uh, locally when, you know, there's maybe a gap or there's nothing happening that month or that weekend. There's always stuff to do and ways to learn and, and uh, a reliance on one another that feels comforting. Um, we just, we have this beautiful multicultural area we're super rich with indigenous culture which i think is incredible and and uh you know i really feel like a lot of work is being done a lot of our residents are working and certainly council is working and me this is a, something really dear to me is working on reconciliation that this is a big reason and i should have said it at the beginning because i don't like to talk about it because it's not a token thing it's I am using my place of privilege, my white privilege to be a voice at a decision-making table where I can help navigate reconciliation because that's really important to me. And I see that kind of happening more and more in the community. We're lucky to celebrate the 150th anniversary of treaty number three, which is the treaty area we're in this year. And um, I, more and more I see the community pulling together for so many things, including reconciliation. And it's really special and important. Do you mind if we chat about reconciliation for a few yeah, seconds of course. here? Okay. Um, there's been a big push for a lot of municipalities and local leaders and uh, uh, communities across Canada to work with our First Nations neighbors and our Indigenous neighbors. Um, you talk about how important is it for you to do that, and and I I I know I yet again I'm speaking from a place of privilege, a white guy from Calgary, born and raised in Ontario, who has a show like this. Um, how important is it for you, and what steps do you take as counselor to ensure that there is uh, reconciliation going on, not just as a tokenism, but as an ongoing effort to make sure that we aren't forgetting about what, what, what transpired, but how we can rectify it. Yeah, a lot of that work um, ties to the mental health and addictions, things we've been talking about. In the area, there are 34 First Nations in, in Northwestern Ontario for, for our public health units region, um, which is a huge geography. Um, and so the lasting impacts of all of like, colonization, residential schools, 60 scoop, all of the, these awful things, all of this multi-generational trauma and impacts are, are so clear. Um, whether you're walking down the street and, and you see our, our homeless or underhoused population in our jails, the percentage of, of people who are living in such a vulnerable state or are, you know, in a going down the road of criminal activity and things like that are it's so it's so high here and so the work that we're doing is always always considering how we can systematically change things so that future generations are not impacted the same way and so how do we how do we manage policing and um you know getting involved in justice and the bail system and how are we supporting people to 
to just have their basic needs met so that they are not, you know, leaning towards substance abuse or, or crime just to survive or just to manage the trauma of everything they've come through. Um, <laughs> sorry. You talk, uh, you talk, no, I apologize for interrupting now, but I want to ask this question because you talk about the 34 First Nation and Indigenous communities that are surrounding uh, the, the city of Kenora, but you, you you are the hub, and I think I will be the first in, you think you've just said it as well, you are a hub for a lot of communities outside of Kenora. How does the city balance and I, what's the word I want to use here? How does the city work with all the diverse groups that are in your community? Because the working with uh, one First Nations community compared to another, or even a, an Indigenous community against the other, because everyone's going to have their unique perspectives on how reconciliation works. And you, as the city who is the hub of the area, has to try and balance all those needs and wants, but also reconciliation as a whole. How does how do you see yourself as counselor, but also the role of council in working with all communities to ensure reconciliation is not just good for one community, but for all 34, but also even outside those 34 for all Indigenous and First Nations people? Yeah, so so we're just one of a few sort of hubs. There's a few other municipalities in the area that um, would see more traffic from different First Nations communities or yeah. Indigenous communities, depending where they're situated. Um, but we... Uh, Right now, for our council, it feels like we are trying to heal some of the relationships that maybe went poorly in the past between council and um, chief and council of the various communities that we're working with. Um, and so we are, you know, we're meeting on various projects and involving them, uh, involving any relevant communities and, and those who want to be involved in some of our development projects, um, economic development Um <clears throat> we uh, we are recruiting for an Indigenous relations uh, person to help us just be that constant communicator liaison. The to help us navigate, like you said, each com each community. They may be Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, but they have different traditions. They have different ways that they do things. They are not a monolith, and so um, having somebody on boarded to help us kind of navigate that and to be somebody consistent because we know we're here for four years and then maybe we're not. And so yeah. if I hold those relationships, which I want to hold, um, but then I'm not, I don't run or I'm not elected, whatever the case is, I don't want that important work for the city and for the first nation community to, to kind of fizzle out. Um, because the way we move forward is moving forward together and we tackle the hard things and we have the hard conversations and we're not each, you know, community the municipality and, and the first nation community we're not always going to be happy about the outcome of this or that um but if we have the foundation of respect and the, the same goal we're working towards on a broader level then i think that's how we you know, how we have to treat each other like we want to work together i appreciate your answer there and i appreciate you taking time to do this and um it's always great to sit down with local leaders and talk about issues that they're passionate about but issues that make their community better and i i want to take a moment and say um and i think this is not said enough to local elected leaders from across canada thank you for serving thank you for putting your name forward and uh, being out there and helping drive the conversation forward around reconciliation around uh, around tourism around nature so thank you so much counselor gosh thank you for the invitation this was was really nice to just think on these things that you don't always have time to reflect on so really appreciate that Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like today's episode.
Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes and is on our website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep driving and delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.